While the Clock Ticked, Book 11, uh, Chapter 6, Waterfront Chase. Joe helped the shock man sit down, then got him a drink of water. Frank, meanwhile, called the doctor. While Joe stayed with Hurt Applegate, Frank entered the next room to check on the open safe he had spotted there. As he came back into the room, he heard Mr. Applegate, his eyes closed, whisper, Rest of the jade in the safe. Frank looked at Joe and shook his head. Cleaned out, he said softly. We'd better not tell him till after the doctor comes. While they were waiting, the older boy called Chief Colleague and reported what had happened. I think the second theft may be a cleverly planned part of the first one, Frank told him. The thief got Hurt Applegate to open the safe and bring out his jade figurines. Then, when he went back for the chess set, the man fled, knowing Mr. Applegate would come after him. Once he was out of the house, it was easy for the thief's confederate to move in and take the chess set and rifle the open safe. Jade figurines, the chief, chief's voice crackled, reminds me of the harbor thieves. They've switched to small valuables, anything they can slip into a pocket or hide under a coat. They're still boarding the ships and getting into the warehouses, and this kind of loot is more precious than the bulky stuff. Yet they get off the piers with it, Frank put in. That's what beats me, declared the chief angrily. We frisk every person leaving the docks, and still the stuff gets out. Um, but how can that be? Frank asked, puzzled. I don't know. We spotted their black car, so they stopped using it. Chief Colleague replied. We're still watching all roads, yet the stealing is worse than ever. Hmm, Frank considered. This has been going on for months now, Chief. Has any of the loot turned up on the contraband market? Nothing, the Chief replied. Still too hot to peddle. They're storing it someplace. While Frank had been talking to the police chief, the doctor had arrived, and Joe explained the situation quietly. As Frank hung up, the medical man told the boys, Mr. Applegate will be all right after a few days rest. It's been a shock, though. I'll tell him about the rest of the missing jade tomorrow. No need for you to stay longer. The boys thanked the doctor and promised the sick man they would help him get his property back. When they walked out to their car, the rain had stopped and the sky had cleared. You know, Frank said thoughtfully as he got behind the wheel, Chief Colleague says the harbor thieves are lifting small valuables now. There's a slim chance there might be a connection between the jade thieves and the harbor gang. What do you say we go down to the docks and have a look around? Joe agreed readily, and Frank headed the car along Shore Road toward town. Seems queer, so many things going on around the Purdy Mansion all at once, Joe said. First, Mr. Dalrymple's mystery, and next, Hurt Applegate traced the jade thief there. Maybe those two cases are connected. Maybe all three mysteries are hooked up, said Frank thoughtfully. In a short time, the boys arrived at the waterfront. At least half a dozen freighters were tied up at the long piers that extended like fingers into the waters of Barmet Bay. In front of one vessel, huge piles of freight were stacked on the dock in the glare of floodlights. The ship's cranes were busily swinging more cargo onto the pier. Must be a rush job, Frank commented as he parked the car. The boys walked over to watch. There was a cool breeze from the sea and the tangy smell of salt air, salt water in the air. Joe sniffed appreciatively. Boy, where are those harbor thieves? I'm ready for them. Yes, but are they ready for you? Frank said with a chuckle. You know, the one I'd like to get my hands on, his brother added in high spirits, the guy that almost ran us down yesterday. Yes? What would you do to him? Joe considered his choice of punishment carefully. Get him behind bars, he declared. As the boys started to walk out on one of the docks, they were stopped by a, a weary-looking steamship company guard in a gray uniform. Okay, you fellows, where do you think you're going? We're just looking, Joe replied in a friendly tone. Well, you can't look here, the watchman said in a loud voice, which attracted a blue-shirted policeman nearby. Catch some of them, Charlie? he asked, coming over. It was Officer Callahan. Oh, it's the Hardy Boys again. 
Let him in, let him in, Charlie. The boys thanked the policeman and started toward the black hauled freighter. Frank and Joe watched the burly longshoremen moving some of their, its cargo away on ham trucks to the warehouses. The man who drove that limousine was husky, Joe recalled. He easily could have been a longshoreman. But Frank noticed that even these men were searched by Officer Callahan as they came off the pier. The boys boarded the freighter and learned from the officers posted there that nothing had been missing that day. Unhurriedly, the, the Hardys moved from ship to ship. Police and company guards were on alert everywhere. Frank and Joe walked back to the freighter from which merchandise was still being unloaded. Several men on the deck were busy operating the huge cargo derrick. Suddenly, as the crane swung dockward with its load, a short, square-built man with a white sailor cap perched on his black, curly hair jumped ten feet from the deck to the pier and dashed toward the warehouses. Hey! cried the other men. Stop! Instantly, the whole area rang with a shrilling of police whistles. Frank noticed a suspicious bulge at the back of the man's baggy trousers. Luckily, he and Joe were near enough to give chase. At the same time, Callahan and the watchman named Charlie came dashing onto the pier. All four piled into fugitive at once. Everybody went down. Arms and legs thrashed. Callahan got up first, dragging the laborer, wide-eyed and breathless, to his feet. Now, growled the officers. Talk, you. Where is it? Talk? stammered the man in confusion. What's that in your back pocket? Frank demanded. Why were you running away? Joe asked tersely. With a look of intense discomfort and dismay on his face, the man reached gingerly behind him. As Frank, Joe, and the two policemen watched eagerly, he brought out a brown paper bag, sodden and squishy. I'd promised to call my wife long distance at seven o'clock and had forgotten. I was having a late supper, so I just put the rest of the food in my back pocket, he explained dolefully. Three big ripe pears sat down on it. Please, fellas, let me off. I've got to change my pants. In complete disgust, Officer Callahan waved the man away. Frank and Joe, grinning at the ridiculousness of the scene, left the big commercial docks. Let's take a spin in the sleuth, Frank proposed, referring to the brothers' motorboat. Maybe we could pick up a clue by cruising around the harbor. The boys pushed open the boathouse door, switched on the light, and looked with pride at their sleek craft. The sleuth rock, rocked gently on the water. The far door opening on the bay was down. Warm in here, Joe complained. Funny, the sun's been gone for hours. He jumped into the boat and called. Got, get the key, will you, Frank? Joe, proud of the craft, put his hand affectionately on the big motor. Quick as a flash, he withdrew it. Hot! he exclaimed amazed. Frank, somebody was using the sleuth not long ago. End of chapter 6